Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Intellectual Videos. Let's do a change of pace here for just a few minutes. I want to read a paper that I wrote and published online. Uh, oh, it's been a couple of weeks ago. And I thought, you know, when I was researching this paper, I was looking through several different books, this theme kept coming back. I thought, you know, that's the universe talking to me. I think I will write this up and, and share it. And it's been decently received, not bad. I mean, I'm not a world famous author, I don't need to be, but everyone has a say. And this is one of my sayings. The reason I want to read this is because of some of the reactions that I've got on it. Uh, they say, wow, you're really on a roll, you're on a diatribe here, or whatever. I wasn't trying to be on a diatribe, I'm simply explaining using a comparison contrast type of approach. And so, by reading it out loud, you can get a better feel than simply by, by reading it yourself, without my input. So the name of the paper is, What Is It That We Need? We, in our time, are spoiled, absolutely, filthy, insanely, stupid, rotten. We are arrogant. We are redundantly proud brats who believe food simply ought to be handed to us at all times. And in the most sumptuous variety at any time of the year, summer, winter, fall, spring, and we want our veggies and our fruit and our meats and our sweets, Good Lord, don't forget McDonald's fast food. We want it now within two minutes, you know, or we will go elsewhere. <laughs> Believing, nay, knowing, knowing that we deserve to have electric lights, fluorescent, was fine, but now we want LEDs, and we do, make no mistake about it. And gas heat, wood, forget about it. That's too much work. Gas heat, much more easy to use. You just push a button on the thermostat and voila, instant pleasant heat any time of the day or night while I'm sitting watching my television show, man. What are you thinking wood stove for? That's for primitives. I'm educated. I got my GED when I turned 44. This surprised people. They said, dude, you have a college education. How could you do that without your GED? I was being sarcastic. And a roof over our heads and clothes to wear, shoes on our feet. What do you mean only 10 pair of shoes? Good Lord, what shall I wear for church if not, if not having a choice to be able to select from 35 pairs of righteous footwear to choose from? What would the neighbors think if I have gasp less than that? Automobiles to drive. Cheap gas so we can travel literally thousands of times further in one day than the majority of people in the 1800s traveled in their entire lifetime. Garbage pickup once a week conveniently right outside my door. Piece of cake. So we don't have to see that crap or smell that crap. Smell the stench. We in the West, more or less, eat better than any of the richest, most powerful kings of Europe. Or ever did from Charlemagne's day to now. And I'm talking about those of us who only earn minimum wage. A boatload greater wealth than anyone earned in my grandpa's day just a mere two generations ago. We can't see very well, so twice a year we get our eyes checked on and we get to upgrade our glasses, make sure we're seeing very well with our eyes. Toothaches, no problem. Just call a dentist conveniently down by the store, by the Pizza Hut, and go have your tooth fixed. And they have numbing agents that they can put in so that it's painless dentistry. A hundred years ago, you had to chug a gallon of whiskey to have your teeth worked on. It hurt so bad. And then the only option you had was to have someone with a great big pair of pinchers reach up there and yank that tooth out. Oh. 
Catherine the Great is rolling over in her grave in jealousy. Oh, are you feeling achy tonight? Poor baby. Here, have a couple of Tylenol. Convenient pills that takes away absolutely every one of our aches and pains. So, the question is, why does life suck? What is going on with the idea that, oh, life sucks? We have hundreds of astonishing video games we can play for pure entertainment while we can eat more popcorn in one night than our parents ever ate in their lifetime. Edward O. Wilson, in his magnificently astonishing, creative, and imaginatively spirited book, The Diversity of Life, after sharing the dynamic and critically important interactions of all flora and fauna worldwide, yes, even those nagging, humming, dangable mosquitoes are vital, the first thing I'm going to do when I get to heaven is ask God, why the mosquitoes? Wilson noted something, apparently, that we're not getting into our thick skulls. Because we love to imagine and vainly mythologize our own magnificent greatness, that we are lords of the world, and we deserve to crush it, and make nature surrender to us and serve our most important human needs. Because the myth we have created is that, as scientists, we have the right to conquer all. Why? Because we're rational, that's why. No more questions. Our way is the best and only proper way to think. Our brains are the pinnacle of creation, we say. And that means manipulate and kill anything that gets in the way of our progress. Any, anyhow we want, any time we want, to demonstrate the poppycock myth that nothing can stand in our way. And God created us to even overtake God. And what finer place to start than the world God created for us to own? We have created a mythic superpower of ourselves to replace the mythic superpower God. And how do you own the earth when you are the Lord of creation? Conquer, quench, and control. That's us. Man, the ultimate, not even close to the supreme God. But hey, we've got science, and we've got rationality, and we are objective thinkers, and that's all we need in order to win. So let's get killing everything that opposes us, shall we? Wilson has shown, aside from our sheer stupidity, as well as our arrogance, that our killing off of the biodiversity of our planet Earth is our own suicide and death. It's time we quit taking ourselves so seriously as being so smart and powerful, wake up a little bit and see that we need the Earth. Because humanity evolved with the rest of life on this particular planet, says Wilson, other worlds are not in our genes. Because scientists have yet to put names on most kind of organisms, as if merely naming something gives us any clue as to knowing anything about it actually anyway, and because they entertain only a vague idea of how ecosystems work, it is reckless to suppose that biodiversity can be diminished indefinitely without threatening humanity itself. We did not arrive on this planet as aliens. Humanity is a part of nature, and yes, you can tell <laughs> that to Donald Trump that this is not fake news. Diane Ackerman is one of those who are trying to at least get us to clear our vision away from our own important magisterial rational selves with her wonderful realization that our yearning to find wholeness as holiness and at one moment fills a need 
ancient and essential as air. I'm an earth ecstatic. I love that. She says, I'm an earth ecstatic. And my creed is simple. All life is sacred. Life loves life, and we are capable of improving our behavior toward one another. That's beautifully said, isn't it? That is really nice. Our problem is precisely explained by Eugene Higgins, professor of psychology emeritus at Princeton University, Dr. Daniel Kahneman. You build the best possible story from the information available to you, and if it's a good story, you believe it. Well, sure. Paradoxically, it is easier to construct a coherent story when you know little. When there are fewer pieces to fit into the puzzle, our comforting conviction that the world makes sense rests on a secure foundation our almost unlimited ability to ignore our ignorance. This is the author of that terrific book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, Daniel Kahneman. The Harrington Spear Payne Professor of Religion at Princeton University, Elaine Pagels, a Gnostic scholar and early Christian scholar, in her witty and characteristically studious analysis and credible spiritual take on things, I might add, examining the recently found lost gospel of Judas, described early Christianity. And I realize this has terrific relevance to us in our own situation right now today. What the new discoveries are showing us is the manipulation and attempts of the powers that be to get us to think, to give us the impressions that Christianity actually was a single, static, universal system of beliefs. They, the early Christian apologists and church fathers, did so precisely because they realized how diverse the Christian groups were. And they feared that controversies over basic issues, like those revealed in the Gospel of Judas, recently found about a decade ago, you remember, they might undermine the universal church they were trying to build. So the myth of the one way to think, all others are labeled as superficial, ignorant, primitive, even subjectively wrong, even downright barbarian. This ties in with this theme I'm going to develop here. It's a real important idea. Thomas Cooley, professor of ethical leadership at New York University's Stern School of Business, Dr. Jonathan Haidt, in his book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, he described how Emil Durkheim found through experiment that humans are not so much homo sapiens as really homo duplex, a creature that exists at two levels, as an individual and as part of a larger society. Honor, respect, affection, and fear, which we may feel towards one another, is one set of emotions and feelings, but another, <coughs> excuse me, but another set of emotions and feelings with a society and the social entity as a whole gives us the psychology that I am simply part of a whole, whose actions I follow, and whose influence I am subject to, the passion and ecstasy of belonging and participating in a group, in a whole, quickly launches them to an extraordinary height of exaltation. These collective emotions pull humans fully but temporally into the higher 
of our two realms. The realm of the sacred, where the self disappears. The realm of the profane, in contrast, is the ordinary day-to-day -day world, uh, where most of us live our lives, and we're concerned about our wealth and our health and our reputation, but we're nagged by the sense that there is somewhere something higher and nobler. Ralph Waldo Emerson argued that the deepest truths must be known by intuition, not reason, and that experiences of awe in nature were among the best ways to trigger these intuitions within ourselves. He described the rejuvenation and joy that he himself gained from looking out at the stars at night, or at a vista of a rolling, beautiful farmland, or from a simple walk in the woods. Standing on the bar ground, the bare ground, sorry, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing, I see it all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me I am a part or particle of God. When we look at the Greek and the early Christian classic scholar David Feidler and what he says, he notes that philosophy, in its truest sense, emerges from a desire to grasp our relationship to the whole. And it constitutes the search for an integrated worldview. All right, that makes sense. Patrick Harper describes one of humanity's most notorious proclivities, that of dividing the world into two. We almost insist on duality, and Western culture favors pairs of opposites produced by its fondness for polarizing. In medieval times, they had the interpretation of the great chain of being, that is a hierarchical view of nature, God at the top, you know, and then, then below God were the angels, and then man, and then the animals, and then the plants, and then the ground. It was a vertical up and down chain. According to E.M.W. Tilliard, their view derived from an amalgam of Plato and the Old Testament, invented by the Jews of Alexandria, and vivified by the new religion of Christ. It was unlike paganism, apart from Platonism and some mystery cults, in being theocratic. The pre-literate peoples, according to Harper, Rather than imagining a chain of being as a vertical ladder, how the preliterate people viewed it was as a chain of being that went horizontal. So this gives us an entirely different view. We were connected genealogically, as a world-renowned mythologist savant Marseille Iliada noted in his many works. They made vivid the idea of a related universe where no part was superfluous. It enhanced the dignity of all creation, even the meanest part of it, the mere grasshopper, or flea, or ant, or bug. Here was ultimate unity in almost infinite diversity. As mankind advanced through time... The correspondence between that of the macrocosm and microcosm, humans summed up the universe in themselves. We were linked to the stars spiritually as well as physically. They influenced, but they did not determine our lives. It's a participation theme. 
in a network of intimate connections. In the ancient Pythagorean cosmology, the phenomenal universe is a mixture. It's a synthesis of the limited and the unlimited elements. Renowned William Blake scholar Kathleen Ramey noted, Modern man in search of a soul is in search not of belief, but of knowledge. That is, the knowledge not of formulae, but of experience. Indeed, nothing can be known about the sacred, but the sacred can be known, and known only as an experience. I thought that was a great little thought, right? And that experience? Well, like the ancients, it is that of timeless being and beatitude. The best way to approach a unity of knowledge is through a diversity. A diversity, as David Feidler says, of epistemological pluralism. Because in the same way that monotheistic Christianity, remember Pagels, just a moment ago I was quoting her, as they strove to eliminate the multiple ways of imagining the divine, scientific materialism has tended to assume that it offers the only genuine way of viewing the deep structure of the world. So seen in this way, science becomes a candle in the dark that is invoked to cleanse the world of every superstition except the superstitious premise that scientific materialism represents the only true path to human knowledge. So there's a double standard going on with this, isn't there? Feidler continuing, not in disparaging science or philosophy, but in demonstrating that it is incomplete and unnecessarily narrow in its epistemological assumption of adopting a monomyth of it being the only possible correct way of knowledge, he says this is the fatal error, or I'm saying this is the fatal error that early Christianity made by eliminating the diversity of views. We are in encountering an alienated vision of human nature is what's happening where the full range of human experience has been reduced to a limited way of knowing. Thus, in the world of academic philosophy, epistemology itself has embodied a suffocating reductionism through its predominant focus on the rational intellect. After all, when you think about this, it is rational entirely so, to become aware of the tremendous interconnectedness of absolutely everything. You see that everything goes together, which is what we mean by relativity, because relativity means relatedness. Fronts go with backs, tops go with bottoms, insides with outsides, solids with spaces, everything goes together, right? And it makes no difference if something lasts a long time or a short time. A galaxy goes together with the universe just as much as a mosquito does. From the standpoint of the self, time is completely relative. It's all a question of point of view or to use a scientific expression, it's all a point of a level of magnification. Look at what's in front of you with greater magnification, and you'll see molecules. And look at those with greater magnification, and you will find space so vast between atoms that it's comparable to the distance between the sun and the planets. The whole universe seems to be a process of playing with different patterns. But no matter what the pattern it plays, no matter what it does in whatever dimension or scale of time or space, it's all on the self.
academic philosophy has the problematic epistemology to systematically exclude all other modalities of knowing, learning, and expression. Art, love, intuition, empathy, compassion, immediate nonverbal aesthetic appreciation of nature's underlying order and beauty, the dialectic of friendship, intimacy, and sharing. Creative process as knowing and self-revelation. Rather than seeing epistemology as an integrative or pluralistic discipline that could illuminate the relations between various ways of knowing, Contemporary academic philosophy has sanctioned an amputation and fragmentation of the self into discrete categories which are not allowed to officially coexist. The cognitive power through which we experience beauty establishes value and meaning. Beauty ultimately transcends reductive analysis. At its fullest, beauty may only be experienced. And through experience of beauty, we become truly human. To experience beauty is to know that we are vitally and authentically connected with the heart of the cosmic pattern. Rational analysis is essentially limited to discursive analysis and definition. Obviously, in this regard, direct knowledge represents the highest form of cognition. What we experience is what matters. At the discursive level, cognition is based on duality, opposites. The rational intellect divides things up it places one pile over here, and then another pile over there, and then it compares both piles. <laughs> and it writes up a little report. <laughs> Through direct knowledge, however, subject and object become one. The mind is united with the actual object of knowledge. Our choice for learning scientific knowledge is not a dialogic spirit between scientism and metaphysical dogmists. Both the scientific quest and the spiritual quest are based on a common underlying recognition. Here's what we have to come to recognize. First, that there is order in the universe. We see that, obviously, no matter where we look. The universe is a cosmos. Second, that the principle of mind is related to the nature of this order, insofar as it can fathom its secrets. Third, that by realizing the nature of this order and our relationship to it, humanity experiences a sense of beauty, a sense of completion. The spiritual and scientific quests are both a search for meaning and value, the knowledge and the experience of being. Moreover, both spiritual and scientific insights originate from higher levels of cognition. But since these insights can only be approximated in words, both science and religion fall into grave error when their ensuing and often provisional models are literally taken to represent the actual territory. The key to this appears to integrate as many possible ways of disciplined knowledge instead of using a mythical model of a monotheism of either science or spiritual epistemology alone without the other. It is the combination of multiple disciplines that lies in our best hope for gaining complete knowledge within our finite limits, of course. That's a given. 
And what this does is it gives us a connected environment with our universal home of which we are a part of it as much as it is a part of us. The universe flows through us. The air we breathe, the sunshine we absorb, the food we eat comes and goes. The water we drink comes and goes. The universe, the same elements that the stars are made of is what we are made of. And we ingest them, and then we expel them. The universe is flow. It's a process. It flows through us, and we flow through it because we are a part of its greater whole. We are not a part from. We are a part of the whole universe. Right? As one of the world's favorite philosophical scriveners has wisely said, Martin Gardner, the statement that science can in principle discover everything is defensible only when reduced to the trivial tautology that science can discover everything science is capable of discovering. It is because I, too, believe in this holy other realm, a realm in which our universe is an infinitesimal island, that I can call myself a mystic in the Platonic sense. I rather like that. Martin Gardner, the great mathematician. And then here are my... I don't know if you can see those or not. Here are the research notes that I used. To come up with this great obfuscation and discourse. My idea was, we feel alienated, we feel lost, we feel miserable because we've lost our connection to the whole. And the way to help gain, regain that connection to the whole is to integrate all of our epistemological functions together to learn from every cotton pick and source, whether it's scientific, religious, historical, mystical, mythical, physical, spiritual, psychological. Use it all, because we are a part of it all, and it is a part of our reality. Hey, I heard my wife clapping, but that wasn't for me, that was for the dog. <laughs> so there's your philosophy lesson for the week. Hope you enjoyed that. Stay tuned, there will be more Backyard Professor videos coming out just shortly.